Uh, welcome to this panel on Solvency 2. I'm Hannah Brenton, a finance reporter at Politico. Um, the European Commission unveiled plans to revamp the insurance industry's capital framework back in the autumn, including 90 billion of capital relief upfront in exchange for the sector's investment firepower, which it wants to drive into the economic recovery and green investments. We will be debating if those goals are achievable, whether the Commission has got the capital balance right, and other issues within the package. Um, I would like to introduce a really uh, stellar lineup for this panel. With me uh, on site is Thierry Filippona, uh, Chief Economist at Finance Watch. And joining us online is Marcus Ferber, German MEP who is the rapporteur on the Solvency II package, Michaela Koller, Director General of Insurance Europe, the industry body, and Sebastian Raspier, Head of the Financial Services Directory at the French Treasury. So thank you very much. We've only got 30 minutes for this panel, so uh, we're going to try and whiz through and keep the answers reasonably reasonably brief because it's uh, easy to get into the technicalities on this one. Um, but Marcus, if I could um, maybe start with you. Um, you're working on this in, in the European Parliament. Uh, can you share some early thoughts on, on this proposal? You know, will it achieve this goal of freeing up insurers' investment capacity? I think that is uh, the main challenge, uh, as we have uh, uh, main goals in the, on European level, which is digitalization and, of course, the uh, decarbonization of our industry. We need long-term investors, and I do not know any better long-term investor than insurers. So, therefore, we should enable them. That's the one thing. The other thing is more a technical issue, where which I have in mind. Um, uh, the proposal from the Commission has so many level two measurements and only a few things on level one. And as the Parliament's powers are a little bit weaker on level two, which means to delegated acts, I would like to put all political questions really on level one and leave uh, the, the delegated acts uh, to, to uh, technical adjustments. And uh, number three, which I have in mind at the moment, but I'm really in the beginning of my work, is the question of proportionality, because uh, we have introduced it in the banking sector, and I think with uh, some success, I would uh, be happy to see more, and EBA is uh, advised to do so, but on the insurance sector, we don't have any proportionality issues at the moment, so therefore, uh, that is something I want to address, and the Commission has done already some good proposals, which could be a good starting point for this discussion. On the, on the level two um, issue that you just mentioned, just to explain uh, a little bit, that's because some of the technical changes to capital are, are held off for delegated acts which the Commission would produce rather than being part of the discussion in Parliament and Council. Yeah, that's a problem uh, that um, <clears throat> it's not only technical things, it's really questions which decide whether insurance is healthy or unhealthy or even dead. Uh, if you adjust some curves in, in different ways and use different models. And I think there are decisions which can't be done by delegated acts via an advice from IOPA that should be uh, decided by the legislator. I'm a little bit unhappy, to be honest, as uh, my first uh, informations I get from council side uh, tell me that the, the council is very happy with uh, these uh, lot of delegated acts. So I hope I can convince them. You know, I was uh, the MIFID rapporteur 10 years ago, and um, we had the same challenge in the beginning, lots of delegated acts. We have not reduced them, but we have left them only to technical adjustments. And then I think it's fine. Well, that's a, a clear question to, to throw over to Sebastian there. You're um, chairing the work in the council at the moment. Uh, is the council happy with this all being kept in delegated acts? Well, first, I think uh, that we share a lot of what Marcus Barber has just said. Uh, the revision of the MC2 is probably more about an evolution than a revolution, but it entails political choices. And the Commission has put forward the investment aspect. Of course, we are also concerned by consumer protection and financial stability issues as well as proportionality. So it's important for co-legislators <clears throat> to be aware of that, and glad that the European Parliament seems to be so, and that's our duty as president to remind that, if needed, uh, within the Council. On this very specific question, it has uh, already been the topic of discussion within the Council, but they are not yet finished. 
uh, first reaction was <clears throat> to be uh, to, to, to want uh, to see more clearly what the Commission has in mind for this uh, Level 2 uh, Delegated Act. And it's clear for us within the Council that we cannot move forward without having from the Commission a clarity on uh, the impact of uh, what it intends to, to, to put in the Delegated Act. That's why uh, you have meetings with member states called EGBPI, where such uh, directed acts uh, are discussed, which take place uh, in between uh, working parties of the Council. It's too soon to, to, to say whether uh, that will be a successful process, uh, comporting member states with what the Commission has proposed at the beginning, uh, but uh, but right now, we are more in the process of doing things right, knowing what Commission has in mind, uh, rather than trying to do everything at level one, because there is, on the opposite, the risk that if you put too much things on level one, if you don't do that rightly, then it's very long and difficult to change that. And in me fear, we had some uh, experience on that, uh, for instance, uh, when <laughs> talking about systemic internalizers. Thank you. Can you um, uh, explain just a little bit what the kind of state of play is in Council right now? Are there any topics in particular that are on the agenda? When we are uh, building on the work by, uh, undertaken by the Slovenian presidency that uh, has made uh, quite a good job. So right now, uh, I think that uh, all member states have a clear understanding of uh, the different aspects uh, which are in this proposal. Uh, so we had a first one of discussions. Now it will be uh, time to go into uh, packaging, I, I would say, uh, in order to be sure that in the end we commit with the political mandate. Uh, that was restated in the ECOFIN uh, Council of uh, October, if I remember correctly. And to be sure that in the end we had a consent among member states, that's why we need, in any case, uh, to, to know what will be the impact overall on the European uh, Union market, but also on more local markets. Uh, that's for sure something that member states want to know before uh, deciding whether they can uh, support a compromise or not. So we are trying to work parallel and uh, in accordance with the European Commission. Okay. Uh, Michaela, um, if I could go back to maybe the, the initial question, we have this capital relief on, on the table in exchange for insurers' investment firepower, but the industry has been maybe a little bit skeptical about the extent of that capital relief. You know, why is that? Well, um, I mean, first let me say that Solvency 2 has, of course, a major impact on our industry's investment capacity um, and how we can cover risk and um, how we can contribute overall um, to, um, uh, you know, uh, Europe's recovery. We uh, are now in a situation um, that um, insurers have over 10 trillion of assets under management and these assets in the end represent the insurance sector's protection and investment capacity. And we have always said that we are happy with how Solvency 2 works. Um, overall, we have very high levels of policyholder protection. We have a more level regulatory playing field, but um, we also have issues. I think Markus Ferber mentioned already the significant burden that we have uh, on the operational side. And that is one issue where we are quite happy for the commission um, that they have uh, made some proposals now, and this is a good basis. And the other big uh, challenge that we have is, of course, uh, the measurement of our long-term business. We have the problem that Solvency 2 does not correctly reflect insurers' uh, long-term business model. We have long-term liabilities, which we invest long-term, and we have the problem that uh, Solvency 2 requires us to measure on a short-term basis, and it, they don't really, it doesn't really um, 
uh, you know, uh, see how we match assets and liabilities. And as a result, we have excessive capital uh, burdens, and that has negative impacts on consumers, on the economy. Now, we had, of course, a commission proposal um, that uh, we were initially uh, really uh, quite uh, pleased about um, because the commission came forward and talked about its intention to free up um, 90 billion of capital. Uh, but they admitted relatively quickly that this would be um, freeing up um, these 90 billion would only be available for um, a temporary um, time. And again, given that we are long term, a long term industry with a long term perspective, if you have a temporary effect, it's almost like as if you have no effect. Um, so ultimately, I think what we are now understanding from the Commission is that their proposal would, in fact, free up capacity of between 15 and 30 billion, which is a good starting point. But we believe the correct measurement of the risks would uh, justify definitely a larger reduction. And a larger one would also be required if you want to be, uh, feel a tangible effect and um, if you uh, want to really unleash the firepower of our industry. How, how could they do that? How could they make a larger reduction? Well, uh, you know, we have made a number of proposals. It's a, a package of a package of targeted measures uh, that is required um, without going now too much into a, a technical uh, discussion. Um, this uh, targeted measures require changes in the risk margin, improvement on volatility adjustment. We have also a better reflection of setting capital charges, you know, for equity and corporate debt. Uh, we want to make sure that we don't have um, changes to the risk curve that would, uh, again, you know, run detriment to the overall intention. So, an, uh, you know, an entire package of measures that um, I think is on the table. And um, we are very um, interested in seeing how um, these improvements can now really be worked out, both, um, of course, with uh, in discussions at Council, but also in discussions at Parliament. Okay. Cherry, uh, what do you make of, of the proposal? Does it get that balance right with the capital relief and the investments? Hmm. <clears throat> Certainly tries to do something which is essential, which is to take prudential regulation for what it is, i.e. a risk-based tool. This is absolutely fundamental. Uh, and I certainly agree with Marcus Ferber when he says that, A, we need long-term investment. That's indispensable and that insurers are by essence, I was going to say, the, the perfect long-term in, uh, investors. This is very, very important. And at the same time, and sorry, this is not the economic side of the thing, but that delegated regulation has a problem, and there is a, a great use of delegated regulation in, in the proposal from the Commission, and that is that at the end of the day, Solvency 2 is a lot of fine-tuning of a lot of very technical things. And all that fine tuning, volatility adjustment, calculation of, of risk margins, uh, matching adjustment, um, you know, how do you calibrate the risk weight, not the risk weight, sorry, that's banking <laughs> jargon, the, 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 the capital requirements for long term investments. All those questions are absolutely fundamental. And yes, they're technical, but they're also political. And we need to have a proper political debate on this. So, you know, I really support the fact that it is healthy in a democracy that we should address that, you know, at level one. I'm really a great believer of this. Now, once you've said that, back to your question is, is the proposal achieving what we need to achieve? I would say yes and no. Yes, because if, as a risk-based tool, it says very clearly that when risk is, for lack of a better word, and a shortcut under control, then there is no reason to, to charge high capital requirements. It makes no sense. So yes, capital relief can make a lot of sense. But on some other risks, it doesn't make sense, and it does not go in the direction where it should go. Typically, take the long-term investment um, block. The idea is to increase the assets that will be eligible to that long-term investment logic and therefore receive a 22% capital charge. Fine, this is good. But we need to go into more detail because some assets should not receive 
that treatment and some assets have to receive that treatment. And typically what I have in mind when, when I talk about assets that should not receive that treatment is typically fossil fuel assets. Why am I saying this? I'm talking only risk here. And in a context where of, of stranded assets, and let me summarize extremely quickly what we're talking about here. We're talking about a situation where there's no scenario under which the value of stranded assets is going up. It is doomed. Either policymakers will take the decisions that need to be taken to address climate change, in which case fossil fuel reserves will remain under the ground, in which case the value of fossil fuel assets will go down, or they will not, or policymakers will not make the decisions. This is very binary. I'm not making any judgment. Well, you know, not here anyway. <laughs> but they will not make the decisions, and then we'll have, you know, plus four degrees of climate change. It's not Philippe and I saying it, it's IPCC, in which case we have a huge impact on financial stability. So in all scenarios, the value of those assets is doomed. Therefore, and there is no moral judgment in this, this is pure economics. As a consequence, fossil fuel assets should not receive the 22% you know, capital requirement. Uh, they should receive the highest of all capital requirements, that's 49%. And the same fossil fuel assets should not be eligible for the matching adjustment, which, as we know, is a way of matching long-term assets, but quality assets, with long-term liabilities, which is a very, very good principle. You know, you match long-term assets with long-term liabilities. That makes enormous sense to allow insurance companies to do their job as long-term investors. So I could take other examples, but this is typically where we need to refine. We need the political debate, hence the fact that I was you know, saying, yes, I agree. We need that to be dealt at level one level, at level one, sorry, um, and, 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 and argue and debate and think together. This is not an exact science, but certainly we need to think together of how you calibrate the risks um, you know, in that perspective. OK. Marcus, is that something that you would consider in, in your proposal, higher capital requirements for climate risks, stranded assets? That's a question, of course, we have to discuss. But honestly, uh, we have to take into account who will have the benefit out of that. Is it the policyholder or the shareholder? <laughs> and that is, of course, a question we have to address. <clears throat> as. Uh, I don't want that we uh, make uh, these adjustments that at the end only the shareholder has a benefit and the policyholder goes out empty. And therefore, uh, that makes it a little bit difficult to give a, a, a clear estimation because you have to think how, how you can adjust these things, honestly, which have to be done uh, if we want to achieve what we want to achieve. But on the other hand, to take care that both have the benefit out of that, the policyholder and the shareholder. OK, Sebastian, uh, I think that this has also been a, a topic in, in council. Um, I think there's been a bit of discussion of biodiversity risks as well. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Oh, that's very, very precise. Uh, no, we are aware since the Commission has put in its proposal green, some greening aspects uh, that it's worth discussing it. I would fully agree with uh, Thierry Filippona. It has to remain with space. And in this regard, it's very interesting uh, as a debate because, and it's quite profound, just uh, one, one thought of that. Uh, when you talk about stranded assets, you look at 20, 30 years, and what Thierry has said is perfectly true. Uh, Solvency II framework, that's a one time, a one year time horizon. And if you stick to that, then, I mean, calibration. There is no reason to have 49 percent. Uh, so we, we see that there is quite uh, a hiatus uh, between including long-term objectives, long-term political goals, uh, which are commitments. So yeah, uh, in a framework which is designed primarily for ensuring financial stability and the fact that uh, the insurer at the beginning of the year will still be alive at the end of the year and able. To, to pay uh, the compensation that uh, insurers are, are able to, to, to ask for. Uh, biodiversity, that's very hard to pick, more, quite more difficult than, um, I mean, carbon, 
because here you have a lot less or even no quantitative uh, measures aspect. So when you're talking about risk base, that's very, very uh, tricky. But my guess would be that uh, in the end, um, it will be unavoidable to have some um, green biodiversity aspects uh, taken into account. Then the right debate is more how to do that fitting in the overall framework and being able to take into account the fact that right now we don't know much, especially when talking about biodiversity. Okay. Michaela, do you want to come in on whether insurers should be uh, you know, taking into account stranded asset risks? Well, generally, let me uh, maybe underline when it comes to the whole sustainability discussion that, of course, as an industry, we are uniquely uh, positioned to contribute, uh, both on the investment and underwriting side. When it comes to managing risks, I think it is important to underline that uh, Solvency 2 is a risk-based regime. And as such, um, you know, it will ask the companies to consider these risks, but we support, obviously, also further work is being done. Um, and um, that by IOPA to, to give further guidance in that respect. Um, we, when you look what is currently going on and also what the commission has proposed, um, there are more regular calibrations for not cut capital requirements. Uh, companies will have to include climate stress tests in their OSA. Um, you know, these are the right uh, approaches uh, to keep solvency as a risk-based regime. And we would be uh, more skeptical to um, include an artificial direction, we would really uh, keep the, the system as risk-based as possible. Uh, that, that climate stress test in the also, why, it does that not go far enough for you, Thierry? Um, two things on this, if you allow me. <clears throat> Perhaps as a, as a short answer to what Sebastian response, we're thinking together, debating with what Sebastian was saying about uh, you know, short-term, one-year uh, risk appraisal. Uh, First of all, stranded assets have already started. In 2020, there was $149 billion of asset depreciation of fossil fuel producers throughout the world. I don't have the 2021 number yet, but let's round it up to 150 billion is not nothing, is it? The other thing is, if really we are assessing the risk only with a one-year time horizon, then we all have a very, 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 very serious problem. Because as we said, we're talking about you know, long-term investors, as we know, and that will take us to your question about you know, stress tests, which by the way are not stress tests. They are scenario analysis, it's not the same thing, even though the communication goes about you know, talking about stress tests. But those stress tests, you know, take what most central banks have done or are doing, have a 30-year time horizon. So, you know, it, I, I think we have to think longer than, than one year, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, that's, 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 uh, that's another story. Stress test, um, climate stress test. Why am I saying they are not stress tests? Because they don't come to the conclusion that the capital shortfall of an institution is this or that. And they are right not to. And why are they right not to? Because we do not know how to do it. Because, you know, l look in the detail at what... Banque de France, ACPR, or Bank of England, okay, not EU, but you know, still, uh, or DNB did, or the ECB is doing now, you know, at the end of the day, they're looking at transition risk, they're looking at the margin at physical risk, but with very strong limitations, and I've had the privilege of sitting in meetings, you know, thinking about this, and you know, everybody's saying, look, you know, we can learn, we need to do it. This is a very, 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 very useful exercise. So let's keep on doing it because we're learning as we're doing it. But we face a major problem is that we do not have the data. And by definition, because we're talking about an event that's ahead of us. So by definition, even if you have the best model in the world, we do not have the data. So we cannot come to a conclusion of capital shortfall is this or that. So what do we do? Do we decide to do nothing or do we decide to take a different approach? And we collectively as a system are faced with a paradox is that we're all used to quantifying first and deciding on the basis of the result of the quantification. But in this instance, 
we will not have the privilege of quantifying. And I hate to say that when we have the data, it will be too late. Mm -hmm. and, um, and as we're talking insurance here, let me quote uh, Henri de Casse, who was the CEO of AXA, and who said famously in 2015 that he did not know how to insure a world at plus four degrees. Now, look at what the IPCC is telling us. The IPCC is telling us the world is on a path to plus four degrees at the end of the century. So I'm not getting into the climate change debate far beyond our discussion here. I'm talking about the link between financial stability and climate change. And if you link what Henri de Castro was saying to what the IPCC is writing, we're saying that we have a major financial stability issue a few dozens of years ahead of us. Because A, you know, if AXA has a problem, you know, all insurance companies have a problem, let's face it. And the other thing is, none of us knows how to run an economy without insurance companies. So how do we deal with that? And the answer is, please address the risk, you know, using your judgment if you cannot quantify. Okay, changing the topic slightly because uh, we're running out of time and I think we could uh, debate this for ages, but um, one of the other aspects of the reforms is the macro prudential side of things. There was a letter from the European Systemic Risk Board recently warning you know, Council and Parliament not to water down those tools um, which are aimed at kind of stopping a crisis spreading from the insurance sector around the financial system. Um, so I just wanted to ask Sebastian, you know, are you heeding that warning or are you uh, considering making changes there? No, I mean, on macro prudential tools, so we, we, we have already heard some discussions. Uh, member states generally seem favorable to the Commission's proposal. Uh, so no watering down, uh, being in, bearing in mind that uh, the, the aim of reinforcing policyholders' protection uh, is, uh, is key yeah, and uh, at the heart of, uh, of solvency too. Uh, there is no will to what are done uh, solvency to uh, on that. It's a framework that has shown uh, its strength also during the crisis. Insurers have shown their strength during the crisis. That was a real stress test, and uh, there is no will uh, on what are done that. That's something separate in our view, in the view of the council, I guess. Uh, from the debate on the calibration uh, for capital requirements um, for this or that uh, asset class, uh, since in the end there is a commitment to achieve something uh, globally uh, neutral, uh, it's more to, 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 to be more precise and more accurate uh, within this uh, global uh, neutrality. So, no. Uh, there is quite a support for the, the commission proposal, so maybe there will be some amendments, but uh, I don't expect uh, much changes. Marcus, what about on Parliament side? Have you thought about that yet? Yeah, I, I read the, the uh, letter with great interest, and honestly, if I look to the areas of concerns, I'm very happy that uh, the European Systemic Risk Board is addressing the risks coming out of low uh, interest rates as <laughs> the chair of the ESRB is the chair of the ECB. So maybe um, Ms. Lagarde can ask her in the one capacity uh, to the other one uh, how to address that. That is something which, of course, insurers take into account and I couldn't imagine that they have not done so. Uh, of course, the issues of uh, buybacks, share buybacks, is an issue which uh, I think should be addressed. Uh, all the others uh, are, are risks which I think we can handle. And uh, so I'm not so concerned about this systemic risk, the European Systemic Risk Board has addressed, going to the details. But of course, we have to be aware, and that is my main approach, um, we do this solvency legislation for the policyholders, for the insured people. And uh, Solvency 2 is uh, the gold standard uh, that was set by more than uh, one panelist uh, today. And we should uh, safeguard this gold standard and not uh, watering it down, but to adjust it on some issues which uh, in the last legislation uh, when Solvency 2 was adopted have not been taken into account or could not be taken into account. 
Okay, our time is, is really nearly up. So if I could just ask um, Michaela and Cherry very quickly. Um, Marcus just mentioned low interest rates, but we are seeing, we've been hearing today about the risk of inflation. Does that change, change uh, anything for you? If I may, very quickly on uh, macro prudential and the IRD, what we are really uh, extremely worried about is uh, these new powers for supervisor to intervene before SCR is preached. Uh, we, we are really strongly against it. Nobody wants to water down Solvency 2, but this would really be a complete departure of the Solvency 2 uh, concept. We are working with MCR and SCR. We have SCR as a very early intervention point. We really don't see the need for yet another issue. We feel that the ESRB um, proposals are maybe a little bit too strongly banking influenced, uh, you know, Insurers have completely different uh, risk and liquidity profiles. Uh, so in that respect, we would really plead uh, to maintain the current structure and uh, make that really work. Okay, Thierry, final word to banking focused on those kind of things. Yeah, well, if you link the interest rate situation and context with the macroeconomic you know, implications and that letter from the ASRB you were mentioning, I certainly regret the fact that the Commission has not followed one of the recommendations of the SRB, which, is, which was, which is, to bring more symmetry in the volatility adjustment. Because obviously, you know, if you only have the capital relief, but you don't have the same thing on the downside, uh, on the other side, then you have a potentially significant macroeconomic or financial stability problem. So if you link that to the current situation you, of where yes, interest rate might be rising, um, then you, you, you would really need to have that mechanism to make sure that we have the tools to adjust, yes, on the way up, but also on the way down. And this is typically where you link the situation where uh, the policy uh, proposal and where possibly we need to adjust, and this is where we need to debate with the parliament and the council. Okay, uh, that's all the time we have for the debate today, but I think it is just kicking off in, in Parliament and Council, so we'll be following closely going forward. Um, so thank you very much to, to all the speakers on this panel, and thank you very much to the speakers throughout the day today. Um, in the next session, it is online, a roundtable discussion on Brexit and MIFID II, moderated by my colleague Mate Roska. Um, do stay tuned for that. Um, for those of us in the room, there's a networking cocktail on site, and we hope to see you all back Back here tomorrow sharp at 8.30 where we will have a joint interview with Mairead McGuinness, EU's Financial Services Commissioner, and Gabriele Galateri di Genola, the Chairman of uh, Generali. So thank you very much and we hope to see you back here tomorrow.